This frozen Sonic Mighty 8K resin 3D printer produces truly stunning prints. There are however some drawbacks and even incomplete features, so let's have a closer look. The last resin 3D printer that I reviewed was also from Frozen, the Sonic Mighty 4K, and it was probably the most fuss-free and smooth review I've ever done. It just worked and it worked well. Well this is its bigger 8K brother, and as the name implies, it has a higher resolution, but it also introduces some other features, some of which unfortunately fall flat. Let's go through my experience from the beginning. The Sonic Mighty 8K is the latest resin 3D printer from Frozen. And the biggest feature here is the 8K resolution. If you're looking to compare its specs compared to other resins ready printers, the best thing to do is to download T2Box, go to the settings and add this printer as well as any you want to compare it to. For instance, we can see compared to the Mini 4K, the Mighty 8K has a much bigger build area of approximately 220mm by 123 and 235 tall. And obviously the pixels that make up the 8K resolution will be higher than any printer that has 4K or lower. On the Frozen website, it's 900 US dollars, although you will find it significantly cheaper on Amazon, still buying directly from Frozen. This particular printer is being reviewed on loan from 3D Printers Online, the Australian distributor for Frozen. And this is happening as always in accordance with my review policy. So on to unboxing and setup. Like most resin printers, this was quite a straightforward process, and for the most part, simply involved removing packaging. The printer's accessories being housed in a cardboard box, sandwiched inside the printer with foam. Other steps required included peeling off protective film and cleaning dust off the bottom of the FEP. All up, setup takes place in comfortably under 20 minutes. Included in the accessories are some sandpaper to rough up the bed surface, although the bed already has a laser etched pattern, which is remarkably effective, more on that later. The rest of the contents are pretty typical, including a pair of gloves, a small funnel, a 12 volt power brick, as well as two separate power cords. We've got both a plastic and a metal scraper, some Allen keys, as well as a USB drive and Wi-Fi dongle. On the USB flash drive, we have some useful files, starting with a pair of pre-sliced models, a readme file to help you get started, a copy of the Qi2 box slicing software, and a PDF user manual. It's very well presented, quite informative in some ways, but lacking in others. Again, more on that later. Before we can print, we need to level the bed, and that starts with turning the printer on. As you can see, my printer wasn't set to English, but fortunately I managed to guess the correct menu items on the first attempt. I could then tap on the spanner icon and go to Z axis control. We can then tap the top button to start the wizard, and we're guided by the instructions on the screen. The vat is unscrewed and removed from on top of the LCD, and then a plain sheet of paper goes down on top. We're then prompted to install the build platform, followed by loosening the four bed leveling screws. If you're new to resin printing, this is a very typical bed leveling method. With the build platform loose, the printer then home Z, allowing the surface of the bed to sit flat and parallel on the surface of the paper. The leveling screws are then tightened with the bed in this perfectly flat position. The bed can then be raised and the vat installed, minus the piece of paper of course. Before pouring in resin, it's always a good idea to run an LCD test, just to make sure everything's firing. With that test passed, I got some frozen 8K resin and poured it into the vat, ready for the first print. Strangely enough, the only print failures that I had came from the pre-sliced model on the flash drive. Generally with 3D printers, anything pre-sliced should be absolutely perfect, because the manufacturer can set it up that way. But this print, that was able to run its full duration without any obvious issues, yielded a net result of absolutely zero on the build plate. There was a cured chunk of resin stuck to the FEP that I was able to retrieve ready for the next print. I started this review in winter and thought maybe my resin area was too cold, turning on this bar heater to low just to help the resin flow. But once again, absolutely nothing. To be honest, I was pretty confused because resin printers really aren't that complicated in the way they operate. I thought about using that included sandpaper to scuff up that lovely bed, followed by a re-level, but fortunately I didn't have to. All I did to fix the printer was to slice my own file, this PSG ring requested by my nephew. With zero physical changes to the machine, I had the result I was expecting, so I guess there was something wrong with the sliced file on the flash drive. 
This is a simple design, but it acted like a proof of concept. Everything is nicely formed, including those narrow parts on the band. So let's step it up a little bit with this bust of Star Platinum from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Again, a model intended for FDM rather than resin printing, but this printer did a good job. The built-in tree supports weren't really meant for resin, some of them were hard to remove, and other ones were able to be removed, but they did damage the model in the process. Next, I decided to step things up significantly with this pirate and his rat bust from Eastman. I quite like the expression on the pirate in this model. There's a lot of smooth surfaces, and they were able to show that this printer had no problem with that. The only blemishes coming from where I removed support material on the underside of the hat and partially on the face. The detailed areas, like the stitches on the hat, in my opinion look great as well. The next model you might have already seen, as I modelled it step by step in a recent CAD tutorial. This is an adapter piece for a cooling vent meant to go on top of a motorsports helmet, and I was able to use it to verify that this printer produced dimensionally accurate parts. To try out some tabletop minis, I spent up big on this full collection from Artsville and Games. I think it actually represents good value for money, with 10 different designs, with multiple variations for each of those categories. There's a rendering depicting the model, and then the STL and Lychee files in both RAW as well as pre-supported, which is what I went for. There's even pre-hollowed variants for those models that need it to save resin. My daughter helped me pick out a range of these to print, and I took advantage of the Mighty's bed size by printing multiple at once. Having each model be pre-supported certainly made my life easy as well. First impressions off the printer were very good, so I glued the models and bases together for closer inspection. And here's what I printed from largest to smallest. Throughout, I'm happy with the trend, which is outstanding detail from the printer and excellent models from the designer. The fine textures do a great job of showing off the resolution of this machine. Take for instance the ripples and wrinkles in this tree trunk, or the array of mushrooms growing on the back of the character. Another highlight are the pre-supports from the designer that are pretty much invisible once removed. Observe the detail in the arms as well as the texture on the platform, and don't worry, that horn was modelled broken. As these models get smaller, they probably get even more impressive. Each of these lower leaves are only a couple of millimetres wide, yet they're crisp and detailed. To me these look great, but if you're a regular to tabletop gaming minis, then please let me know in the comments how they stack up. This is the smallest model I printed from this set, and once again it's got beautiful crisp details. To put it into perspective, if we look at the eyebrows on this figurine, they're about as wide as the grooves in my fingerprint. Resin printing really is mind-blowing. This is a stunning collection, and what you see here represents only a fraction of what was included. My final test print was architectural, with this church from Germany. True to form, another crisp, detailed model, showcasing another one of my favourite uses for resin printers. As soon as I started slicing my own models, I had zero failed prints. So we've seen that the print quality, in my opinion, is simply outstanding. And a lot of that is to do with the 8K screen resolution. But physically, the printer is also robust, with full metal construction, twin beefy linear rails to guide the Z-axis, a build plate mounting system that is both precise and repeatable, and the same could be said about the optical sensor used to home Z. Elsewhere there's adjustable feet for sitting the printer level, and it is nice that the USB flash drive inserts conveniently at the front of the machine. The touch LCD on the front was both attractive and sufficiently large to easily navigate the menus of the printer. Another big plus are the pre-made profiles in Chitu Box. I didn't feel the need to deviate from any of the default settings, and every time I needed support material, I just used the auto-generation, which was quite satisfying to rip off without the need for any tools. So in terms of printing, I really can't fault this, but there are other aspects that need some attention. Firstly, let's talk about that laser etched bed, because it grips prints extremely well, sometimes too well. When I tried to print directly on the bed, the imprint of the surface was left in the model and the model was damaged trying to get it off. And even when I printed with support, I found that the base of the support was almost impossible to remove. After a lot of hacking, I did manage to get it off, but some sections were really stuck onto the bed, and I needed a razor blade to remove them. But that's okay, because the manual describes a Z offset setting, allowing me to move the bed a little further away from the FEP. And once I changed the offset to 0.1, this completely fixed the problem. The model stuck well, but they could be removed with the scraper. The only problem is, it's a slow setting to change, because you have to wait a while for the bed to home from the top of the machine. 
After that, you can input your Z offset and save it, but the offset will be lost every time the machine restarts. But the main area I had problems with was the printer's Wi-Fi connectivity. The supplied dongle goes in the back, and then you use the touch screen to enter the network settings, input the password for your network, and finally toggle on the sharing network, where the username and password will be supplied, as well as confirmation of your IP address. Except when I typed this address into my browser, it always refused to connect. Confused, I rechecked the manual, not finding anything I thought I was doing wrong, but then I found a video on Frozen's YouTube channel showing a completely different process to using a browser. It seems that the IP address needs to be entered into a Windows Explorer window, then, after entering the username and password from the touchscreen, the user would gain access to the internal drive of the machine. Relieved, I tried to follow this exact process, but unfortunately found it quite unresponsive. Once ever, I got it to ask for the username and password, but after I entered this, it told me it was still not accessible. I tried different computers from different rooms and had the same problem, with Windows confirming the device was not responding. I even dragged everything upstairs in desperation to plug it in directly to an Ethernet port, but I still had no luck. And then it struck me, if using the Wi-Fi was so limited, then why did they bother to include a webcam if I couldn't access it? I searched the user manual without success for the word webcam, and eventually noticed a remote control button in the menu that when pressed, said further functionality would be released in August. Well, on the Frozen website, such an update was waiting, with clear instructions on the firmware update process. Basically, you put the files on the USB flash drive and select them as if you were going to print. After some confirmations, the process takes a few minutes, ending with a prompt to manually restart the printer, which when power cycled, updates a second part of the system. After running through the first start wizard again, including setting up my Wi-Fi, I was highly disappointed to find the exact same message saying that remote control still wasn't enabled. Let's summarize. Like I said, when it comes to the ease of printing and then the print quality, I really have nothing to complain about. However, you can't ignore the fact that this machine was released in an incomplete state and that's not good enough. Maybe a future firmware update will fix some of the niggles and add the missing functionality, but at this stage, we can only speculate. If you're looking to get into resin printing, but are unsure over the mess, workflow, and safety, I have a beginner's guide linked below. Head down to the comments section and let me know what you think about this printer and whether 8K is the right direction for resin 3D printing. Also in the description, you'll find links to all of these stunning models, including how long they took to print. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy resin 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.